Uh, thank you for coming. We want to talk a little bit with uh, Heather this evening, as we typically do, or atypically do, in a way that, that just for those of you who haven't listened to these discussions before, haven't listened over the years. Reza, you think you could chase down those guys? Do, do you mind? Yeah, thank you. So the point, uh, the generative point of these uh, exhibitions and discussions, and for those of you who belong to Making and Meaning, you heard me say this the other day, that most of the faculty visiting and otherwise who are also practicing architects sit on juries and, and, and let students know uh, what should be done and what shouldn't be done and why it should and why it shouldn't. <clears throat> and the premise of, of the gallery, or a premise of the gallery, was to shift the onus of that responsibility for doing back onto the faculty and to put the faculty and, and other architects who come to visit in a position where they also have to account for what they do and why they do it. So there's a sort of equity in the discussion between people admonishing students directing students and a discussion with the faculty about why they do what they do. So this is, this, is the, uh, this is the hypothesis of these discussions and the background for this. We've been doing it for about um, five, six years. For those, I don't know if there are any thesis students left standing today, but one of the topics that comes up in the thesis reviews, mid reviews and final reviews, has to do with, with the discourse itself, the discussions, the labels, the intellectual associations with projects that you're doing. I think very often we talk about projects here and everywhere in a sense that an idea in architecture can, can originate in almost any frame of reference that belongs to human and natural affairs. But when you do that, when you make a reference and you say punked, something like that, as opposed to, for instance, putting it up and saying nothing, nothing at all, but when, when you set up a context for a discussion with a word like that, then almost inevitably, at least as a portion of the discussion, we, we, we try to investigate or interrogate those words and, 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 and those meanings. It's also possible to argue that whatever you say in, in the end, the building is up, it's on the street, you walk away and the building is the building. So there are two sides to this discussion, but certainly in the context of SciArc, where, where at least a portion of the responsibility is to account for what you do and why you do it, the language that you use to describe what and why is an issue. So to start off with a very long-winded preface, to, to start off, the name of the exhibition is Punked. And, and uh, you're gonna correct me if I'm wrong, do any of you know the, the, the history of uh, Sid, Sid Vicious, the Sex Pistols, all of that stuff? Are you familiar with that? Just if you know it, if you heard of it, you can signify by raising whatever you like. Nobody ever heard of that? Well, Only the you older go. people. None of the students have heard of it. No. We have a generational divide here. Well, it's interesting, I mean, in terms of who you're talking to or what it means. So why don't we start off real quickly with, with um, a discussion of what it means to label an exhibition punked. What is that? Can you tell us? Uh, sure. Um, I would start off by saying it's not titled punk, it's titled punked. That's what I which, tried to say. Uh, uh, Couldn't get doesn't it out have of anything it. to do with Sid Vicious, although there is an element of Sid Vicious in, in here. Punked is actually if you, I, I suppose you would have to look it up in the Urban Dictionary, it wouldn't be in Webster's, 
and uh, it would say that punk is a practical joke. Uh, I don't mean that in a cynical way. Um, and it was a, a show that was on MTV for roughly 10 years in the early 2000s. Um, and there is a thread of that lineage in the piece, but there's also a thread of punk in the sense that you described it with, and I'm glad you mentioned Sid Vicious because I was looking more at uh, the punk style that was coming out of London in the mid-1970s versus other kind of punk genres around, and that would be the Sid Vicious vein. Um, so that is an appropriate reference. I would say that in almost all of my projects, there wait, wait, is... Wait, it's an appropriate reference with respect to the audience or in terms with, of you talking to yourself? Uh, Who are we talking to? Uh, it was a reference that was useful to me in making certain design decisions as I was developing the project. Whether or not someone is able to identify that reference in the finished piece, um, uh, I was hoping that it would uh, have a bit of a punk sensibility to it, um, but it was more... I would say, instrumental for myself in the design process. Um, uh, specifically, the use of uh, spikes as a, a primary material detail um, that you see throughout the piece. And, you know, I had an earlier version that I tried to kind of fashion more into a mohawk, but it, I wasn't able to uh, get it to work. Um, did I didn't hear what you said? Say it again. Uh, there was an earlier version where I tried to uh, shape it more into a mohawk. Uh, you know, haircut. Yeah, the spiky haircut. Um, but that didn't, uh, I wasn't able to get that pencil out. Um, but I did retain so would have been the spikes. So it would have been a mohawk if you could pay for it? Uh, possibly, yeah. I don't think it would have, I think it would have been a subtle change. Uh, the effects would have been uh, very similar, um, but the expression might have been subtly different. Um, I would say that in most of my work, there is a kind of extra disciplinary interest that I fold in to most of what I do, and that interest uh, shifts around a bit. Um, but uh, uh, when I am thinking about what to call a project or how to name it, I tr always try to associate it back to the extradisciplinary reference that I was thinking about in the development of that right. project. Well, as, as I said, and I think, I think this, is, this is important and it's useful for all of us, that the origins of a project in architecture could be almost anywhere in human or natural affairs, I think, I think that's worth noting. But then the associations that belong to the context you're associating with have to be germane or have to be accounted for in mm -hmm. the discussion. Otherwise, we just put it up and we don't talk about haircuts and we don't talk about punk. Because punk also means ripped off, fooled, mm -hmm. tricked. Mm -hmm. I think, so it has a whole series of associations that, so are we being fooled? Are we being tricked? I mean, any of those, no. it's, it, none of those associations. No, 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 no. It, it's not uh, meant in a cynical way whatsoever, very kind of straightforward. No, but fooled um, and tricked wouldn't be cynical, but it could be deceptive without being cynical. In other words, you're pointing somebody one way, but actually they should be understanding in a different way. So it could be that, that, that there's, there's something surreptitious about the project, and mm -hmm. punk means tricked. Mm -hmm. Tricked. Yes, yes. So are we being tricked? Uh, I don't think you're being tricked. I mean, if, if I could go into a little more detail, I can explain um, in greater depth that reference. Uh, the initial aim of the project was pretty simple. It was to de develop a technique for integrating architectural and graphic um, design. 
and uh, to it is is a way of um, developing a technique. I looked outside of architecture, uh, specifically at textiles, and um, stumbled upon tartan. Uh, hold, hold off on that for one second, Abby, because we're gonna we're gonna get into that. I just wanted to stick to the original topic, which had to do with the associations with 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 Sid Vicious and Punk and. There's this other, I have to say, if you guys read the, the text that, that Heather wrote, I mean, when these exhibits are done, there's always you know, one, of, one of these things that comes, so you should grab it, and it's, it's I think, very unusual. It's, it's intelligently written, and, and the form language actually suggests, if not a new vocabulary, certainly different choices that are available to characterize work, it, whether, whether the work actually lives up to the text or delivers what the text aspires to, it, we, we, we'll talk about. But the text itself, uh, there are a couple of these, a couple of these uh, items that I actually wrote down. I, I can't say I know 100% what the hell you're talking about. But, but, the, but as a suggestive uh, place to begin, it actually sounded promising. I, I, I read you one of these, and, and then Heather can uh, tell us uh, what she's talking about. So, da -da 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 -da, a technique called tectonic painting. Tectonic painting? Tectonic painting uh, supposes that when the logic of construction is part and parcel of the graphic field, the range of effects that are possible multiplies. With tectonic painting, the graphic field emerges out of the logic of construction. Specifically, this installation seeks to modulate color gradients, views, opacity, figu figure legibility through the structural interpretation of graphic strokes. Okay. So I think I think the the first question would have to do the term or the 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 hypothesis of something called tectonic painting, which seems to be uh, a contradiction in terms, in the sense that painting belongs in a conventional sense to a surface, and tectonic might imply something which is which is developed volumetrically, although that probably isn't necessarily uh, the only way to read that. And the question is how you put those two, which if they're not, not non sequiturs, maybe they suggest very different kinds of possibilities. So maybe you can tell us what tectonic painting is and how the logic of construction of the project is is ratifying the idea of the tectonic or the painting. What actually happens to make that a, a, a plausible piece of a new architectural vocabulary? Tectonic painting. Yeah, so okay. So what is, what is that? Um, well, I would uh, claim that this is an example of a tectonic painting. Oh, um, it isn't? It is. Yeah. No, yes, yes, I would claim that it is. Yeah. Um, and again, when I was uh, uh, trying to develop ways of integrating um, architectural and graphic form, I knew from the beginning that I, I wanted to steer clear of any methods of applique, which seemed to kind of dominate uh, uh, that um, uh, uh, area of interest. And what I mean by that is when a kind of material substrate is constructed, such as a wall, and then it has paint applied to it. That would be a graphic applique over an architectural um, uh, 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 body. And it's very common, it's pervasive. I think most of us do it in our work, but um, I wanted to develop a technique for integrating the graphic and the architectural that wasn't reliant on uh, methods of applique. And so again, I looked outside but of architecture. Applique meaning attaching something to a two-dimensional surface. Yes, mm -hmm. that you build uh, an architectural shape or form, and then you apply a graphic, whether you adhere wallpaper or you 
printed image. So they don't image. belong to each other in the sense that we make the wall and then no, we paint it red. No, well, I wouldn't Typically. necessarily say they don't belong to each other, but I would say one is generally subservient to the other, which is that the graphic is subservient to the architecture. The paint belongs on the wall, the tile way. on that the floor. Wall is painted, the wall is painted white. Yeah. The white doesn't obligate the wall in any particular way. It doesn't no. make the wall behave. or the, So there's no exchange between the but paint. But the wall and, obligates the white. It couldn't really be anywhere else. So, but but the tectonic painting seems to have to do with some kind of mutual obligation. Yes, that's right. Okay, which is, um, how does that work? And so, well, okay, so again, in order to, to kind of find inroads into how to do this, I looked outside of architecture and um, uh, identified in textiles means of, uh, 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 that exist of doing this, and I tried to translate the logic of textile construction into architectural construction as a means of developing tectonic painting. Um, oh, wait so, a I mean, just to, because I think a lot of what I found is a lot of the quotes had a certain amount of not visceral but but instinctive appeal, and then if you went from the instinctive to the analytical. Then it's not okay. So there's a me there's a mechanism for doing textiles with I don't know what it is, but threads perpendicular to each other or something yes. like that. Threads perpendicular to each other, which make a two-dimensional surface, well, which has a thickness itself. Yes, there is some dimensionality. And then, so, let's say because I don't know what I'm talking about in, in terms of in terms of textile making. So how is that convertible, how is that mechanism, a two-dimensional mechanism, threads north and south, threads east and west, into something which is volumetric? And I think, by the way, we're on the sub while we're on the subject, is the volume what from, from the gray frame up, or is the volume from the gray frame down? Is the volume of what you go into, or is the volume, would, would you have made the point if you just took that whole thing down and stuck this frame, one of the four pieces, and stuck it on a wall? Wouldn't it make the same point? Uh, when it, when, if one of the three sides was against a wall, I suppose it would still be a tectonic painting, but it would result in a different architectural no, 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 I'm experience. Just to, I'm just trying to get at what it means to take a two-dimensional mechanism, e.g. threads, that runs in, run in a certain way, again, north, south, east, west, and convert that to something which is volumetric. Okay, How well, do you do that? Let me and, 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 and if that's what you did, then why are we looking at all of these pieces and why don't you simply take the conversion 2D to 3D, which is this, mm -hmm. which you call 2.5D, but nobody knows yet that what that means, but you're going to tell us in a minute, and just take this whole thing down and put that over there. Okay, well, let me um, back up to the first question I think you asked, which is how to make the translation from the two-dimensional to the three-dimensional. Um, so, you know, in the uh, very straightforward way, the, the tartan fabric is... Uh, uh, dyed um, uh, threads of wool that are woven together, yeah. horizontal, vertical. Um, they're colored threads, so you'll have like three red, six black, two yellow, etc. Three red, six black, two yellow. And when a... Uh, so the same threads that are going north-south are going east-west? Well, the colors could be different. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be the same. The colors could be different. But what happens is what that, that when a red and a black uh, threads overlap, they produce a maroon. So what the eye picks up is maroon, not red or black. Um, so it's a technique for generating gradients. Um, and I literally tried to, to do the same thing here. Instead of using uh, dyed uh, wool thread, I used strips of perforated aluminum. Um, instead of weaving, I interlocked them. And then once they were interlocked, I twisted them at either end in order to generate overlaps. Um, and that those overlaps would allow you to see through black onto white and a gray tone would appear as a result. Well, let me just so move you, hold on a second. 
just just to understand it a little bit more precisely. So the colors don't matter. In other words, it doesn't matter whether there are the same colors running north-south as they're running east-west, or there are a certain number of colors running in one way or running in the other way, or how do you make that decision? And then when you go from, that's a piece of it, and doesn't that affect what you get volumetrically if you make certain decisions about what you have two-dimensionally? And how do you go from two to three? is really the question. In other words, what do you do physically? What's the mechanism for going from, from this to this, from a two-dimensional, mm -hmm. how did you do it? Well, it's... I mean, the reason I'm asking is if you could evaluate and you understand it, then I can say, well, okay, you did this, you bent this, you folded this, you rotated this, mm -hmm. you animated that, mm -hmm. whatever you did, and then I can say, well, but if you had done something else, in other words, what are the options that this gives you? And the question is, is this inevitable? Or are there 10 possibilities that could have come up? I'm trying to understand what I'm looking at. I don't know yeah. yet how you did it or what the, yeah. you know what I mean? I, I maybe know what you mean. I'll try to clarify. Um, I, the colors, uh, for myself, the colors, I, I wanted very high contrast colors because I thought it would be um, uh, easier to perceive gradients or in-betweens if I was using high contrast. Um, and at this particular scale, uh, limiting the number of colors is more effective, I find, than if I had, say, four or five colors on this one panel. There's just not enough room uh, for that much variation. Uh, is, it, is this a full-scale project? Yes. So it's not a model of no, something no, that no, should no, be no. a convention center or a high-rise or something like that? No, this is the I mean, I, b I believe that the technique could be applied to a larger project, but this is a standalone thing. It's not a representation of something. It's not a model of something. It just is what it is. And um, so can you can you help us with the, the operational mechanism? How'd you do it? I mean, when you're looking at this, I mean, you can say it doesn't matter. You can say it's an instinct or you can say you don't know. You can say it's none of your business or you can tell us how you did it. I'm just, it, again, I'm trying to understand what the mechanism is for translating something which is two-dimensional to three-dimensional. I'm trying to figure out, if, if, could I run it the other way? Could I run it from three-dimensional back to two-dimensional? How would I do that? Because if I could do that, then I could take pieces of this thing and I say, okay, I want this piece two-dimensional, I want this piece three-dimensional, so on and so on. Is that possible? So that, I mean, if, for instance, you wanted, to, you wanted to trace the origin back and forth in the project, or there were two perceptual possibilities, here's where I started, here's halfway through, so that this is, is this the, you know what I mean? Is this the conclusion? Is this the end of the discussion, or could it go further? Or in, in other words, if we saw a chronology of operations, would that help us to understand what the possibilities were? You, you understand what I'm talking about, or you don't mm -hmm. have no idea? Well, how do we get to this from, from somebody, some guy in Scotland wearing a plaid shirt? How do we get to this, is the question. Um, well, I was, uh, again, I was trying to uh, figure out how architectural materials, now that we're moving from uh, textile to architecture, you have a shift in material, right? From uh, thread to whatever you choose to work with, wood, steel, aluminum. Um, I selected aluminum because it's uh, light and flexible and, and fairly inexpensive. And um, yeah, but, you know, I, I don't know, maybe I'm not asking the question clearly. I mean, for instance, would this have been truer if it had been made out of thread? No. Assuming you could keep it stiff? No. I mean, I, I give you, and I can't think of a good way to explain this, but let's say I took my shirt and it was made out of tartan or whatever that is, and then I uh, blew it up and mm -hmm. inflated and it floated up like a balloon, okay, just for the hell of it. 
And so I've taken something which is two-dimensional and in a very simple-minded way, inflated it, now it's volumetric. So I no, can tell I you where so, it started. I think when you make that um, transition. You know what I mean? Yes, That's but I, I think uh, uh, when you make the uh, transition from one thing, say fabric, to this architecture, uh, the effects that emerge are very different and are specific to the medium that you're working in. And so I, it would be very different had you taken thread and blown it up and made a, I don't know, hovering pillow out of uh, 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 tartan fabric, um, it would not be able to, it would produce a very different set of effects than what's being produced For sure, I, and I think and there's- so th I think the effects that I was looking for are specific to the medium that uh, this is in. I'm, I'm trying to understand the convertibility. I mean, it's a little bit like it's punked. So here comes Sid Vicious or Vivian Westwood or Sex Pistols or something. That matters, it doesn't matter. This was a discussion we had at the beginning with the association of, of a vocabulary assigned to a project and what, what connotations that has for the understanding of the project. Meaning, if you don't wanna have that discussion, don't call it that. But if you call it that, then you're asking for that to be, so if, the origins of this belong to a threaded surface with, with threads running perpendicular to each other. And the graphic hypothesis has to do with the colors associating with each other so that what you see is not what it is, but a blend of the two yes. things, which is, which is a useful graphic association but what I, what I don't understand is how that then turns into this. And so the associations between threads in one direction, threads in the other direction, colors that become colors they're not. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a mechanism which now becomes another mechanism which it wasn't. And how that's done and how the association with the original uh, cloth surface either belongs to the discussion or belongs to the visual experience of the project so that we understand, and again, one prospect is that we don't need to understand that, that it simply is this. But again, when you make those associations between fabric and the making of fabric, which I think interests you in the surface and the ground, and now you're making it into something which has very different qualities and aren't the, the associations or the linkages, don't they matter? Something originated here and it winds up there. So it is what it is there, or it is what it is en route from here to there. And while it's en route, it leaves associations or traces, or, or its meaning belongs to that transition. So it either is what it is in the end, yes or it is what it is as a consequence of the transition, in which case the transition might be legible. I guess I said this already. And then you could run it in like a film, you could run it in two directions mm -hmm. if you wanted to, and you could use portions of that in here so that uh, it's conceivable, as I said, a piece of this would be flat, like the fabric, and a piece of it would be the burgeoning object and then a piece of it would be the final object. For instance, as opposed to what a lot of people do, is you go up on the wall and say, okay, you wanna know how I did this? I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. There it is. That's the chronology of it. And the only advantage that, that, that gives in, in the context of a discussion is that you can then look at, 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 at various operations and you could say, well, when you did this, but you could have done this or something. So it gives it gives another way to, to, to read it and to understand it. So I'm, anyway, maybe I just dropped that. I mean, not yeah, to be able to. okay. Well, um, you know, there are, are bound to be problems of conversion that will arise when your, um, converting a certain type of material intelligence into another type of materials intelligence. And that I think 
oftentimes those problems of conversion can lead to really surprising uh, results. So once I had made the translation from the fabric into the architecture, I just wanted to play with what that could produce. Um, it was not about trying to uh, uh, retain or capture the origin, but rather what could this um, uh, uh, produce in the, uh, uh, I guess, um, material and medium that I was working in. Uh, and so, I mean, is it fair to say this is, that sounds like some kind of associative instinct as opposed to I did X, Y, and Z, which wouldn't have to be a chronology line to a goal, but again, somewhat, would it, would it have been a better project if part of the pieces belonged to something which was two-dimensional as opposed to three-dimensional? Is that, would that be another way to understand it? Meaning, in, in a certain sense, all of the sides, the three sides, the three sides, right? Yeah. The, the, the three sides are finished in, in very similar ways. Yes. And we're going to we talk about the differences in a second. So would it have made sense to show evolution on the way to a, a, a conclusion or no? Um, I, I don't necessarily... I wouldn't want, I wasn't interested in transitioning between something two-dimensional to three-dimensional to two-dimensional to three-dimensional. Um, I think when it is flat... It'll give you a kind of versatility because the convertibility from two to three and back and forth and in between gives you a different kind of notion than, than, than this is the end. Mm -hmm. and, and especially, and this is the same discussion as Sid Vicious, especially when you make a very clear point in the text of, of locating the meaning of the conclusion in a very particular beginning, which is an unusual beginning for an architecture project as conventions in architecture go. So I'm just trying to, to tie those together. I think uh, there's, another, there's another aspect of this that, that follows, which is when you read about tectonic painting and you talk about the sex pistols and you talk about tartan cloth and all of that, what is, what, what is the meaning of the object in the space, the three-sided piece, looking at it from where we are, walking through it, underneath it, all of that? What are those associations of the project in the space which are not discussed in the text at all? Why it is what it is, which is why I asked you, wouldn't it have been just as good to hang it upside down from the ceiling or to hang it in different locations, just put it on a wall and disassociate it from a different volume, you know what I mean? With legs that holds it up and allows you to see it. So what, is, what would that choice mean um, in terms of what seems to be the tectonic painting premise? You know what I mean? Like, why are we showing it like this? Which, which isn't part of your discussion, I don't think. No, and, and I, I would honestly, it would be a real stretch for me to tie that back to um, uh, ideas of tectonic painting. I think that in, you know, in this project, certainly there were competing interests um, as uh, most things, I believe, when you're developing it, you don't have just one interest. There's a couple of different interests and oftentimes those come in conflict with one another. Um, and there were certain ideas that I had just about the thing as an object separate of any kind of tectonic painting or whatever that um, uh, certain readings I wanted it to have. One of those readings was that it was not, um, its particular location in this gallery is specific, but the shape is not, um, uh, or the overall form or shape what was is- the, lo the location belongs to the, what idea? The location is, um, is 
uh, uh, intentionally off axis. One, um, as it, it uh, works with the kind of diagonal of the circulation, it kind of pulls people around and through the thing, but also it was important for me that it was off axis so it doesn't seem to uh, belong to this particular space, that its it doesn't, uh, it doesn't. shape or its form it is not specific to the gallery that it's located in. When you, when you think about this or projects like this, were there a series of, of options, the, the, the Mohawk discussion aside, but a series of uh, thoughts about how to show the consequences of this convertibility 2D to 3D. I mean, in other words, suppose you took this thing and flipped it upside down and attached the legs to the ceiling, let's say, and it hung, which would mean that it would be a very different proposition to see the inside and so on, or whether you took the legs and stuck them on the wall and we already talked about the possibility of I mean, just making things up that, that might be ways of, of illustrating the premise as it's written um, without raising a completely different question, which is that I think in my apprehension that the object qua object supersedes the meaning of the surfaces maybe you know in other words by making it in a certain way spatially and presenting it in a certain way spatially do you undercut what is the primary objective which is the surface and how you made the surface itself i, I don't think so because um it w was very uh, the effects that are produced in the surface are very different when you're on the interior than when you're on the exterior. So to turn it, flip it 180, legs up hanging from the ceiling, you would uh, uh, lose a lot of the effects that get generated on the interior. And that's largely a consequence of the relationship of the light source to the material, to the eye. Um, the uh, when you're on well, the you, outside. But let me just understand the, the, the inside. Is I, I didn't get it yet, but I'm sure there's 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 a reason for it. For instance, so this is my uh, shirt, uh, the prop for this discussion. So if I look at the inside of the shirt and the outside of the shirt, what happens? And I don't know with a textile, but maybe this is so that you understand, like you, you take your dress and flip it inside out, and the, which I'm sure Sid Vicious probably did, or Vivian Westwood, so inside out and upside down. But it has a very different meaning on the inside, because the inside allows you to understand, I think, from a, I don't know whether this is true of tartan, but from a constructability, I mean, if you look under the carpet, let's say, or a weave, a different weave, you understand it differently, and to some extent, you understand a mechanism as, as uh, an assembly mechanism from the inside that you might not understand with a finished piece on the outside. So then the question is, when you're looking at this thing, from the end of you walk through there and you're looking at it, do you understand something about that? I mean, would that, anal I'm trying to, I'm chasing it back to analogy with, with cloth, do you understand something internally that you don't get externally and therefore it's important to see both of those and to look at them and to understand the difference or do you kind of see more of the same from the inside that you see from the outside, in which case the reason for seeing it in both ways is is a different discussion. No, I think it's pretty different um, what you see from the outside than the, the inside. Certainly the inside is, is uh, really explicit in terms of the, the logic of construction, um, but uh, also the, I don't know what you would call it, the field of morays and gradients are much more apparent when you are looking through the thing 
versus, which is uh, uh, how I understand it, from the interior, it's more about looking through the material um, versus but you're, but the you're outside talking, when you're looking you're at it. You're talking about the, the graphics. Yes. And, and I'm talking about a technical mechanism, not so much the graphics. I'm talking about like how it got to be what it is. I'm saying if you look inside somebody's shirt, I mean, I'll have to do that to see if what I'm talking about, at least my hypothesis of, of, of textiles, is that you carpet, you, that I know, I mean, you can see from the underside of a carpet what you can't see from the outside. Not so much the color, you learn something about the color too, because the amalgamation of the color on the surface you see or use is different than the strands of pieces that put together, go through the thing and make the thing on the outside. So what I'm talking about is an, an old architectural discussion, which is how you understand how something is put together and whether that assembly process is part of the language of architecture or whether it isn't. That's a general debate, and we're not having that at the moment, but whether seeing it from the inside then allows you to understand in a technical way how you got away with what you did, which you wouldn't be able to understand on the outside, which would then give some kind of experiential reason or how to learn about what Heather did reason for putting it up in this way. Yeah, I think, um, so uh, again, I think, you know, the visual effects are different from the interior and the exterior, but the interior does make much more explicit the uh, uh, method of construction. Uh, the bolts are incredibly visible. Uh, the seams are visible. I, uh, you know, went to an effort on the exterior, the frame to um, not have any uh, bolts pierce the kind of uh, four inch um, uh, steel L's, uh, steel angles. Um, and have all of the um, fastening mechanisms be inside of the frame so that you wouldn't perceive them from the exterior. Um, but once you're on the inside, all of that is very obvious. Can you tell us why there are three surfaces? What are the differences? I mean, should there have been 10 surfaces or would one do it? I mean, why? why did you decide on three, and what do the three give us that four wouldn't, or two wouldn't, or one wouldn't? Yeah, um, you know, the, the three sides are three sides of a cube. Um, they're exactly the same in terms of their size and proportion. Um, so it's three sides of a cube, rotated point up and uh, three points down. I wanted specifically to have a very simple shape uh, so that the conversation Three or- Three sides of a community, this is the right angle. Right? Yes, they're all right angles. Um, uh, they're all right angles. Um, and I wanted to work with a very simple form so that the focus of my investigation would be elsewhere, uh, which was the kind of material effects that I was trying to produce. Um, so I kind of settled on a cube very quickly. Um, the, you know, I, I don't want to bring, I don't want to answer this in pragmatic terms, but there certainly are pragmatic answers um, in terms of the cost effectiveness of repetition. Um, and which is one reason why all three sides are, are, are the same. Um, I would have loved to have but expanded. But they're not literally the same. The colors are different. Right. Other than that, they are literally the same, yes. And within one, let's say, stripe, I mean, with this line, like let's just for the hell of it, one, two, three, take the third line yeah. running from, from uh, uh, bottom to top, and the pieces, the, the, the triangulated pieces, are different. Each step is different, right? And yes. the differences are more pronounced as it moves from bottom to top, 
or are the differences, in other words, are the differences incremental from one piece to the next, or are the differences logarithmic? I mean, what are mm -hmm. the differences? Mm -hmm. I mean, the differences aren't linear. The differences, they're jumps. I mean, yes. you couldn't, if you had the first one, you wouldn't necessarily know what the second one is. And if you have the second one, you wouldn't know what the third one is. And if you went to the next row, it would be different. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah, it is. It, it, the, on a specific strip, the spikes rotate in an incremental uh, manner in that uh, that particular degree Well, there are is... two things, so the rotation and the shape. Yes. So the shape is not the same, nor is the rotation the same. It's moving. That's correct. Right. Yes, it but, moves. Right. And then it is different from one row to the other. Is that the way the thread works? In other words, there's a thread next to another thread, and if you see the thread over the course of the thing, it turns, I mean, in your example, there's a red no. and black. No. No. So the threads would be conventional yes. lines. So yes. this is an interpretation yes. of a reading. It's yes. an instinct. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. not a, it's not a translation mm -hmm. or a transfer. I mean, there's not a mechanism that gets you there. It's an interpretation. It's an interpretation, yeah, right. sure. Um, uh, and that the, the kind of angle of increment is set off by the 45-degree uh, twist of each surface. Um, I think that's, that's almost all I got. I wanted to thank you. I want to recommend to you guys um, that you read the text. Again, I think, I think the text is, is a contribution to the discussion and the vocabulary actually invents uh, notions which, whether, whether they come to fruition here, but begin to suggest associations, I think, between two dimensions and three dimensions that are, that are worth uh, further discussions. And, and uh, I want to thank you for your effort and your time and your, your patience. And everybody hopes you survived OK. And uh, have a nice evening. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thanks, sir.